Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream number 152. Three. Is it 153? We did a, a, a gift episode last week that was unusually placed. This is unusually. This is 152 by the official numbering scheme, I am mm, thinking. Nope. Well, we are going to have to talk to the officials, and, okay. and, and we are they. Um, it is live stream. Technically, it's 152. For professionals here. Yes. Nothing, nothing unprofessional about this. I am Dr. Brett Weinstein. This is Dr. Heather Hying. These are some of our companion animals who have no advanced degrees whatsoever, but nonetheless, we're not going to use them as trusted sources unless uh, they are qualified to speak of things like uh, kibble, for example, mm -hmm. or... Uh, the They're interested in deer and otters. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. absolutely. Maddie discovered a, an intense interest in otters this week. Yes. Our Labrador. Yes, yes. it's easy to, uh, to, want to, to relate to. Otters are fascinating creatures. She seemed to want to place otter in mouth. Oh, well, yes. Um, I, I do not have that instinct, but I can appreciate that a, uh, a wolf derivative such as this might, <laughs> uh, might feel that way. Indeed. Um, all right. We are going, we follow these live streams through the live Q&A. As you guys know, you can ask questions at darkhorsesubmissions.com. We're going to try to keep it tight today. Um, so uh, it will be relatively short, uh, both episode and Q&A, but we will do one. So go ahead and ask your questions there. If you're watching on YouTube, there's live chat on Odyssey. You can always find me at naturalsections.substack.com as well. And... Uh, we have a new store, darkhorsestore.org, with lots of cool products. We talked about some of them in our um, holiday gift episode, which we did last Sunday, which is uh, not, we did not put it out into the audio podcast world, but it's up everywhere that we put video. So Spotify, uh, YouTube, Odyssey. It does have audio, but it's just not separately. We decided not to mime yes. that. I think that was a good choice. I indeed. I wasn't sure at first, but... I, I, I came around. I have no yeah. regrets. Yeah. We are supported by you, our audience. Uh, you, Brett had one of his conversations with his patrons this morning. You're going to be having another one tomorrow, as you do on the first Saturday and Sunday of every month. At my Patreon, we do a, uh, month, a private Q&A uh, once a month. Usually it's the last Sunday of the month. This month, uh, so as not to do so on Christmas, we're going to be doing it on the penultimate Sunday. And actually, that reminds me, what I meant to start by saying is that we will not be seeing you here next week. Or you won't be seeing us here next week. Uh, so the next time we're going to be here is the 17th. There will presumably be a guest episode of Dark Horse being released between now and then, maybe even two. I don't know. Um, it is technically true that we will not be seeing them next week. We might see some of them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it is likely that we will not be seeing any of them here next Saturday. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, so if you have burning questions, get them in now. Uh, and if you are interested in, uh, in supporting us on our Patreons, we, of course, are very grateful for that, especially given that YouTube demonetized us gosh, close to a year and a half ago now, and have not rethought any of their thought on this, or maybe on anything, as far as I can tell. Um, and at both of our Patreons, you can access our Discord server, well, where, for instance, they have book clubs, which is pretty cool. So uh, consider going there. Uh, and, um, of course, we have sponsors. We are, uh, we are very choosy about uh, the, the companies that we will... Um, read ads for on this podcast. We do three at the top of the hour. You could tell that we are reading sponsored content when there is a chime at the beginning and the end and there's a green perimeter around the screen. And uh, without further ado, let us do those three ads now. So I said that and then I wasn't actually prepared. Our first sponsor this week is Ned, a CBD company that stands out in a highly saturated CBD market. Ned was started by two friends who discovered that their hyper-modern lives were leaving them feeling empty, bewildered, disconnected. Something about this way of life, as they say on their website, just wasn't working. So they started Ned. You can buy CBD products in nearly every coffee shop or grocery store, but Ned's blends stand out. I'm particularly fond of their de-stress blend. Ned's de-stress blend is a one-to-one -one formula of CBD and CBG made from the world's purest full-spectrum hemp and also features a botanical infusion of ashwagandha, a place that Brett has always wanted to go, he tells me. Cardamom. It's, it's on my bucket list for sure. Sure, sure. 
cardamom, and cinnamon. CBG is known as the mother of all cannabinoids because of how effective it is at combating anxiety and stress by inhibiting the reuptake of GABA, which is the neurotransmitter responsible for stress regulation. This combination leaves me feeling a bit easier with whatever comes my way. Many of the CBD companies out there source their hemp from industrial farms in China. Just like with low-quality alcohol, however, low-quality CBD can have undesired effects. NED is USDA-certified organic. All of NED's full-spectrum hemp oil is extracted from USDA-certified organic hemp plants grown by an independent farmer named Jonathan in Paonia, Colorado. Hey, Jonathan. Also, NED shares third-party lab reports and information about who farms their products and their extraction process on their site. These products are science-backed, nature-based solutions that offer an alternative to prescription and over-the-counter drugs. They are chock full of premium CBD and a full spectrum of active cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, and trichomes. Ned's full spectrum hemp oil nourishes the body's endocannabinoid system to offer functional support for stress, sleep, inflammation, and balance. And we just received in the mail yesterday, and I haven't tried it yet, uh, what looks like an amazing uh, chai blend, sort of a sleep, sleepy time blend that they've got uh, that has, well, ashwagandha, I believe, reishi, um, various spices, and, um, and oh, magnesium. So it looks, it looks yummy, and uh, I have not tried it yet, but I, I suspect that that will be amazing too. So just another new Ned product. If you'd like to give Ned a try, Dark Horse listeners get 15% off Ned products with code DARKHORSE. Visit helloned.com slash darkhorse to get access. That's H-E-L-L-O, that's how you spell hello. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D dot com slash darkhorse to get 15% off. Thank you, Ned, for sponsoring the show and offering our listeners a natural remedy for some of life's most common health issues. Yeah, but that raises a question. Sure it does. What is the stepmother of all cannabinoids? Um, why not the stepfather? I uh, was going to get there, but I've, the stepmother is um, uh, more dangerous as lore would have it. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure that that's true Probably in reality. Probably yeah, Could be. Hmm. Good. All yeah. right. I, I would take that as a hypothesis. Sure. Yeah. At least as a starting point. Yep. Uh, second amazing sponsor this week, ours. <laughs> Just going to... Change up the order of the words in the sentence. <laughs> you know, that can work. So there are better sentences sometimes buried within a sentence right in front of you. There are sometimes. I don't think that was it, though. Oh. Our second amazing sponsor this week is Vivo Barefoot, Shoes Made for Feet. Regular listeners are well familiar with Vivo by now, but if you're not, you're in for a treat. Seriously, try these shoes. Most shoes are made for someone's idea of what feet should be. <clears throat> Vivo's, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, Vivo's, however, are made by people who actually know feet. Mm. Someone put ice in my water. <laughs> I'm doing great. Practical <clears throat> jokers, no doubt. <laughs> yes, also known as our son. Um, here at Dark Horse, we love Vivos. They are beyond comfortable. The tactile feedback from the surfaces you're walking on is amazing, and they cause no pain at all because there are no pressure points forcing your feet into odd positions. They're really fantastic. Our feet and yours are the products of millions of years of evolution. Humans evolved to walk, move, and run barefoot, but modern shoes that are overly cushioned and strangely shaped have negatively impacted foot function and are contributing to a health crisis, one in which people move less than they might, in part because their, sh- their shoes make their feet hurt. Vivo barefoot shoes are designed wide to provide natural stability, thin to enable you to feel more, and flexible to help you build your natural strength from the ground up. Foot strength increases by 60% in a matter of months just by walking around in them. The number of people wearing Vivo Barefoots is growing. Once people start wearing these shoes, they don't seem to stop. Vivo Barefoot has a great range of footwear for kids and adults and for every activity from hiking to training and everyday wear. There are certified B Corp pioneering regenerative business principles and their footwear is produced using sustainably sourced natural and recycled materials with the aim to protect the natural world so you can run wild on it. In it. No, on it. It says on it, but I feel like in it is better. No, no. It's definitely on. You run wild in a place. I you? know, but with these shoes, you're on it. Oh, okay. Go to vivobarefoot.com slash darkhorse to get an exclusive offer of 20% off. Additionally, all new customers get a 100-day free trial, so you can see if you love these shoes as much as we do. That's V-I-V-O-B-A-R-E-F-O-O-T dot com slash darkhorse. Yeah, if we're going to run wild in it, that would be Middle Earth shoes. Totally different thing. They're a little hobbity. It's a fair point. Yeah. All right. Our final sponsor today is Public Goods. 
Public Goods is a one-stop shop for everyday essentials. Their ingredients are carefully sourced, high quality, and affordable. You can simplify your life by getting your necessities at Public Goods. Public Goods has coffee and tea, grains and oils like olive and avocado. They have spices and extracts, vinegars and hot sauces, dishware and glassware. They have everything you need to make a meal, including the materials to serve it on. And that's not all. They've got stationery and laundry detergent, Castile soap, trash bags. They even sell plants. Public Goods searches the globe to find clean, healthy, eco-friendly, innovative products. Uh, Public Goods cares about health and sustainability. Their products are free of harmful ingredients and additives, and the ingredients are ethically sourced. Rather than buying from a bunch of single product brands, Public Goods members can buy all of their premium essentials in one place with one beautiful, simple, streamlined aesthetic. And their subscription service is efficient and simple and easy to use. Public Goods members can buy all their premium essentials in one place. It really is an everything store. For Dark Horse listeners, we have the following offer. Receive $15 off your first Public Goods order, no minimum purchase. They are so confident that you will absolutely love their products and come back again and again that they are giving you $15 to spend on your first purchase. Go to publicgoods.com slash darkhorse or use the code darkhorse at checkout. That is P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash darkhorse to receive $15 off your first order. All right. <clears throat> Some things happened this week. Wow. So many things. Yeah. I've, I've got, uh, <clears throat> God, <clears throat> this is going to keep happening to me. I've got a few things to add in, um, but you've got two main topics that you want to spend our time this week talking about, and uh, why don't you begin? Yeah, and in some sense, I'm not sure it's two topics. There is an overarching topic that is very much in motion, in large measure, I think, demonstrating the principle that uh, we have advanced here that zero is a special number, which is to say, interesting things are afoot with respect to, I, I don't know whether I should say free speech, because free speech is narrowly a First Amendment issue, and I believe the issue that is actually in play is free expression of ideas, which is protected by our free speech rights here in the U.S., our First Amendment. But nonetheless, whichever way you put it, free expression is something that is now in motion. That is to say, we are in in motion from an environment that existed a month ago to some new environment, hopefully, that will be very different as a result of the fact that Elon Musk has purchased Twitter, which has put it under his control, and is uh, changing its policy. And the reason that that matters so much, Twitter is uh, relatively small compared to other social media sites like Facebook, but it is a place where influential people have conversations. And to the extent that it is not open to all perspectives, that Uh, leaves us in a realm where there is nowhere to go to have those conversations broadly. And to the extent that he opens it up and stabilizes it in some form where it is hospitable to these conversations, it then changes the environment for all the rest of those platforms. Because after all, who is going to go to Facebook or Instagram if you can only have an adult conversation about serious stuff on Twitter, right? Those places are going to look ridiculous And that's a phrase that no one expected to happen. Right. Yes. No, not something you could have predicted, but, you know, that actually demonstrates another principle that we talk about. Welcome to complex systems. You couldn't have predicted this. Um, But we do find a lot of influential people on Twitter um, uh, attempting to have conversations. And you and I know, as well as anyone, that those conversations have been um, heavily influenced and not for the better by a moderation policy or a something that masquerades as a moderation policy which has been uh, not even arbitrary just has simply been so partisan that um, it has created a kind of a Disneyland environment inside of Twitter um, which is not to anyone's benefit and that raises the other thing which happened only yesterday on Twitter I don't know how much you followed it but Um, Twitter released through Matt Taibbi um, the first and an installment of, uh, what would it be, self-exposés, revelations about what took place inside of Twitter that resulted in Twitter uh, obscuring the Hunter Biden laptop story and suspending the New York Post, which had published the story, 
uh, because it said that the story was the result that effectively the laptop was some kind of sophisticated disinformation campaign by the Russians and um, that uh, therefore it was not going to be party to spreading these lies in advance of the election. Now, of course, the release through Taibi illustrates that they very quickly figured out inside of Twitter that this was not Russian disinformation, that in fact the story, as far as anyone knew, did not justify uh, Twitter by any established policy preventing people from posting it. Um, but they did it anyway. They continued to do it. And, you know, so anyway, that is an interesting revelation, potentially extremely consequential, because this happened right before an election. It involved Joe Biden indirectly, but it involved Joe Biden, who was implicated by some of the things that Hunter Biden had said, right? Effectively, Hunter Biden involved in <laughs> Ukraine, of all places, involved in energy policy in Ukraine, a place where he had no expertise, making a bunch of money, seeming to indicate that his father's influence was for sale, which of course is apparent enough to those of us who follow politics, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, both peddle influence, and it should be extremely frightening to us citizens that we are in the process of potentially electing somebody who might be peddling influence that could start a war, could start a war with Russia of all countries, a nuclear armed nation. Um, so discovering that the Hunter laptop was in fact legitimate was important, but that uh, discovery was delayed by largely Twitter's actions in suspending this, and Elon Musk has now revealed that through uh, one of the few remaining excellent journalists on Earth, Matt Taibbi, which uh, is all very interesting. Next chapter, though, uh, if you look at today's New York Times or Washington Post, now mind you, I don't have the electronic rendering of the paper versions of those things. Mm -hmm. um, I think you need to be a subscriber at the New York Times uh, in order to see their what they put out on paper. But if you look at I mean, this... I, I don't have time to do it now, but we can, we can always do that. We can always do that. I, yeah. I was hoping we could. But, Zach, do you have the uh, screenshot of the New York Times site that I sent you from this because morning? Because we still... I mean, maybe it's because we do this at this point. That's my excuse. We are subscribers to both. Um, mm -hmm. So... I sent you a, s okay, a screenshot so, from the New York Times. Yeah, okay, well, I, okay, yes. And what it will show is that there is nothing here about the major revelations that... So what this is, for those just uh, listening, the New York Times site in which the search is for Twitter for today, December 3rd. Is yeah. that right? So I also, I believe, sent Zach the front page, which shows no indication. And if I search for Twitter to see but, if they ha wrote the story but buried it, it does not show up. And this remains the case if you switch that uh, from a relevance search. I think you're now looking at the Washington Post. But yeah. uh, if you switch it from uh, a most recent search to a relevance search, it doesn't change it. They apparently did not write the story about what happened uh, on Twitter yesterday where this major news event, the internal communications that surrounded the... Well, I mean, it was Friday night. They probably were all busy. <laughs> you know, there was a time when newspapers reported news and even, be it Friday night, um, you would have gotten such a story. So something funny is up, right? You don't say. It has been apparent. You want to show that Washington Post one? The same thing is true if we go to the Washington Post. They didn't write the story either. I would argue that's completely predictable. Sure. Um, so, okay. It's absent from these two major papers. You want to go to the New York Post now? The New York Post, which, uh, as you so recently... Uh, the Show me the front page. Which, as you recently said... Uh, was the outfit easily laughed at until recently uh, that was the one <clears throat> that broke the uh, Hunter Biden laptop story in the first place and got itself kicked off Twitter as a result. Uh, but the New York Post So the New York has Post something has to say. the headline right here up front. And actually the New York Post is, um, so this is an opinion piece. Actually, this is not their front page, but this is the, uh, so that's fine. It, don't worry about it. Um, so... In their opinion piece, uh, they write that 
what was released on Twitter yesterday was incomplete in that it excluded the FBI's influence, the FBI having spread the false story that this appeared to be Russian disinformation, which was ostensibly the basis for the exclusion of the story from Twitter, which then the emails that were released by Taibi yesterday reveal they immediately knew inside didn't fly and that they had no reason to exclude this story and yet decided to continue to do it, which matches a pattern also revealed by uh, Matt Taibi yesterday, where it turned out, this is surprising, that influential people on both sides of the aisle were able to make contact inside of Twitter and suggest that certain tweets be moderated. Mm -hmm. um, but that this was heavily biased in favor of the blue team's influence by virtue of the fact that the people inside of Twitter are heavily biased in favor of the blue team. So anyway, it's an it's a it's a extremely important story from the point of view of seeing how the machine um, works. Um, and the fact that even today, you've got Twitter revealing this thing and the New York Times and the Washington Post don't feel forced to write the story, no matter how important it is, maybe especially because it's so important. All right, so that's sort of the immediate context. Free speech is now revealing some another property that we've talked about here. Certain stories diagnose the system. The story of Hunter Biden's laptop diagnoses the system. We can now see what Twitter did inside. We can see what the New York Times and the Washington Post still do with it. We can see that there is this nebulous interface with the federal government where the FBI is seeding information on which a, a, uh, uh, a platform might uh, erroneously exert its influence. And it's all quite ominous and explains in large measure how we ended up in such a terrible um, divided situation in this country. All right. In that context, if we go back slightly farther, what we have is an incident earlier in the week when Kanye West on Alex Jones' program on InfoWars showed up after, I guess we should go back even further. He showed up initially with Nick Fuentes, a very troubling character, uh, white nationalist, certainly by implication, if not by his own admission, um, showed up on uh, Tim Pool's podcast. And uh, Tim Pool pushed back on some of the uh, absurd things that, that West said about Jews. And West stormed out after something like 15 minutes. So after that incident happened, he then shows up on uh, InfoWars. Now, the important thing here is that Alex Jones has been thrown off of Twitter and has not been brought back. Um, so InfoWars lives on presumably its own site. They had an interview with Kanye West in person. Nick Fuentes, who's traveling with Kanye West, uh, is there as well. And um, Alex Jones, in this context, is the voice of reason. Now, I I barely followed this. I was I was. Uh, let me just say that one of the things that this situation reminds me of is that we are living in an era that celebrates the mentally ill, that puts them front and center and either uh, and either admires them and tells them how amazing they are and their delusions or leaves them open for the mockery that will surely come and it's disrespectful it's mean it's dangerous it's bad for the individuals for sure but it's dangerous for society and I know that's not the main place that you're going here but my overwhelming sense, and I, you know, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm experiencing sadness as an emotion this week for for other reasons. But I, so maybe I'm just more prone to be seeing, to be feeling sad about this. But my overwhelming sense of this and of the, some of the, of some of the, the the children who are claiming they are trans and being, you know, just manipulated and 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 destroyed, my overwhelming sense at the moment is not anger or surprise or any of the number of things that a person could feel. It's it's just sadness. Like, I don't, I really know almost nothing about Kanye West, but I, 
Isn't there anyone out there who loves him enough to keep him, to protect him from himself, honestly? Um, so, look, this is one of the places that we need to go here. Now, I don't know if what we're seeing is the result of mental illness. That's certainly uh, a plausible way to connect these dots. Um, I have to say, the greater tragedy is what is being done to us by the elimination of our ability to have a rational conversation about any of this, where yeah. should you manage to create a rational conversation, it is immediately dismissed as right-wing or something like that, right. right? So the problem is we have to have the conversation about how to treat each other well, how to be nations, how to exist as whatever the West is. Not exactly a nation, right? Mm -hmm. But it is clearly, in some sense, an emergent culture that has to defend itself. We've got to be able to have a conversation about how you do that. And instead, people have gamed every system of conversation so that none of those things can take place. So that if you succeed, then you are dismissed. If you fail, then it is considered evidence that it wasn't possible to begin with, right? The whole thing, the conversation environment, has been thoroughly rigged. And so let me just finish describing what took place, Kanye West shows up, I think without explanation, on uh, Alex Jones' program, wearing, it's not even a face mask. It is something that covers his entire face, including his eyes. Presumably he can see through the material, but it's a very bizarre thing for him to do, especially in light of the fact that it, I think, clearly was him. I, any voice analysis should be able to tell you if it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, he shows up somehow disguising himself, a hand on a Bible sitting on the table in front of him. And of course, he says all kinds of preposterous things, which Jones attempts to back him into some form of reasonability, and he's having none of it. So he definitely says that, uh, you know, he thinks all human beings uh, bring redeeming things to the table, you know, including Hitler. Okay, well, you know... No doubt one could come up with some pedantic defense of that statement. Jones pushes back, and he's like, no, I actually like Hitler. Um, yeah. So, you know, he... Doesn't he say, especially Hitler? He does say, especially Hitler. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway, so he just, he makes it very plain that his perspective, at least in his current state of mind, is that uh, he has affection for Hitler and the Nazis. And it's, you know, and mm -hmm. in, in his, uh, I believe in his interview with... Tim Poole, he said that the Holocaust didn't happen that way or something. So it's like all the worst stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's Holocaust denial. It's affection for Hitler. Um, and the question is, what are we to make of this? And I have not done a tremendous amount of digging on people's arguments here, but there is one in what I looked at, and I looked at enough stuff that I don't see anywhere, which I think ought to be front and center. My feeling is on thinking about this tragic, bizarre spectacle, the kind of train wreck you can't look away from, that the real answer is that actually, if you stand in the right place, it makes maybe the strongest possible case for free speech on our platforms uh, in the sense that the founders meant it. Even this bizarre spectacle, which, you know, I'm not a believer in the category of hate speech. Obviously, much speech is motivated by hate, but it's obviously not a legal category. It is protected by the First Amendment like everything else. Even this obvious case of hate speech, the embrace of a genocidal maniac, that the not only does the principle of free speech require us to defend this, but it actually demonstrates why we must. And so I wanted to make that case, just so that it's on the table at the very least. And the way I see it is this. Kanye West is exceedingly popular. At least he was last week. Um, I think it's been a little while. He is exceedingly popular. I don't think that could possibly be an exaggeration, even if he's lost half his audience. He's exceedingly popular. In fact, the thing you point to, the pathology that has no name, where somebody becomes so famous and so wealthy that no one can tell them no, right? The thing that uh, I believe killed Prince, that killed Michael Jackson, 
right? The idea that these people are so elevated that they will be injected with, you know, drugs that will kill them um, because basically they can have whatever they want. I, I will just say I was making a broader point than that. This wasn't about is he too famous for anyone who loves him to help him. This was, a, a, I think, a, a more important and far broader point that as a society, we are embracing mental illness. And most of the people who are having their mental illness embraced have no fame at all. And in fact, many of them have narcissistic tendencies and are seeking fame. Yep. Uh, and the response is not, um, I'm sorry you're going through that. Let's see if we can treat that and return you to some, uh, some semblance of normalcy in the best sense of the term. But rather, oh, yes, you are in fact a, a lizard. And uh, we're going to make sure that anyone who says that you're not is roundly disciplined. No, I, uh, look, I think you're making an excellent point. I do think that there is something that is almost inscribed in the new rules um, in which we are forced to um, not dismiss uh, certain kinds of assertions as crazy, even though they transparently are. And... Um, and that's clearly going on here. But anyway, even, I mean, let's just play my game here for a second. He is exceedingly popular. I don't know how many million followers he has, but it's a very large number. He has also got political aspirations. He's run for president once very, well, you roll your eyes, but... When somebody with as much reach as this person has decides that they want to do something like this, the idea that it is preposterous is obviously wrong, okay? And Donald Trump proves this, right? Donald Trump managed to get himself elected president. So my point is Kanye West is the kind of person who brings together certain things that could conceivably put him in the presidency, right? A nuclear armed presidency. And so the idea that we might take utterances of his that are beyond the pale and shield them, thereby protecting us from the understanding, even if, and I, I do think one interpretation here mm -hmm. is that this person is having a... Uh, a bipolar, a manic episode, that they don't really believe these things, that we're hearing things from their you know, darkest fantasies and not their actual understanding of the world, and that therefore it would be ungenerous for us to imagine that this is what Kanye West thinks. I don't know. I don't follow him under normal circumstances, so I don't know how out of character this is, if he's just finally admitting things that he believes, or if these are things he doesn't really believe, and two months from now he'll say, look, that wasn't really me. I don't know. But what I do know is that anybody who would say these things is not fit for office. And so my point mm -hmm. is, no matter what the meaning of this episode, it is vitally important that we be able to see it. Vitally important. And to make that point even a little bit stronger, mm -hmm. notice where we did see it, right? We saw it on Alex Jones' program, who has yeah. himself been banished to the fringe of civilization, right? So the point yeah. is, you know, okay, we can now take video from this channel, which uh, the you know, elite world would clearly like to disappear, sure. right? But this channel is responsible for us being able to see something important that actually might be at some point relevant to the governance of the country and the fate of the world. So, you know, it seems to me like it couldn't really be a stronger case for, you know what, let us, you know, not be snowflakes and let us not pretend that the fact that somebody has said something terrible means that we are all going to be persuaded of something or we are going to be so injured. I mean, look, I'm Jewish. I have as, right, as much right to be injured by somebody denying the Holocaust or saying Hitler was a cool guy as anybody. But you know what? It doesn't bug me. I think I'm looking at somebody who's either involved in performance art or it's a mental illness or it's both or I don't know what. But mm -hmm. the point is, yeah, I think it's pretty important that we all heard him say it. 
Absolutely. Um, I actually think that that, uh, that segues neatly into talking a little bit about Anna Krylov's newest piece, okay. if, if we can. Yep. Um, so Anna Krylov, uh, regular listeners will remember, I read uh, from her piece called On the Perils of Politicizing Science back in Livestream 84 in June of 2021, which was published in the Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters, not, the, not a place where you might expect a piece called On the Perils of Politicizing Science to show up. Um, <clears throat> she is herself a chemist at USC, born in the Soviet Union, and so no, knows wherever she speaks. Uh, I've since had the opportunity to meet her. She's a wonderful person, uh, as wonderful in person as in writing. And uh, she made a speech at Duke a year ago that is now published on Dorian Abbott's Substack. Dorian Abbott himself is a geophysicist at the University of Chicago who writes on Substack, uh, I haven't written it down here, Heterodox Stem is the name of his Substack. Uh, and he himself ran into trouble with a, with woke culture when he co co-authored an op-ed in Newsweek summer of 2021, in which he claimed uh, that DEI, that is diversity, equity, and inclusion, violates the ethical and legal principle of equal treatment. Um, quote, it entails treating people as members of a group rather than as individuals, repeating the mistake that made possible the atrocities of the 20th century. It requires being willing to tell an applicant, I will ignore your merits and qualifications and deny you admission because you belong to the wrong group, and I have defined a more important social objective that justifies doing so. It treats persons as merely means to an end, giving primacy to a statistics over the individuality of a human being. Uh, for writing that, he his talk at MIT was canceled because the mob... Um, made all the usual claims about being hurt and, and, and injured by, by this kind of argument. So that's, um, that's Dorian Abbott, the geophysicist at University of Chicago, who has just republished Anna Krylov's speech to Duke just this week. And so Anna Krylov's piece, uh, which is called, uh, just a minute, once I scroll to the top, Zach, you can show my screen here if you like. Uh, this is just a PDF of the piece I'll link to um, at Substack in the show notes, From Russia with Love, Science and Ideology Then and Now. Uh, and again, she is uh, born in Soviet Union, uh, now has been in the United States for a very long time, a chemist at USC. Um, and I wanted to say that she has uh, organized her remarks in this piece, which I recommend you read the whole thing, into a discussion of the atmosphere of fear and self-censorship, which is related to what you've just been talking about, the omnipresence of ideology, with examples from science, the intolerance of dissenting opinions, suppression of ideas and people, censorship and newspeak, to use Orwell's term, and the use of social engineering to solve real and imagined problems. And it's really easy to go to, um, you know, using social engineering to, the, the problem with using social engineering to solve imagined problems is uh, a death whammy that no does not make it a good thing. It makes it even worse. Uh, but let me, let me read a little bit uh, here from her piece. Let's begin, writes Dr. Krylov, with the pervasive fear of speaking up. First, some definitions. Self-censorship is the refusal to produce, distribute, circulate, or express something for fear of punishment. Self-censorship is different from discretion. When I choose not to talk about my views on religion at the dinner table in order not to upset my mother-in-law, that is discretion. But when I choose not to say in a faculty meeting that considering only diversity candidates for a faculty search is discriminatory because I am afraid of being ostracized or worse, that is self-censorship. The flip side of self-censorship is compelled speech. That is when people express opinions that are not their own for fear of punishment. Again, there is a difference between telling little white lies in order to please someone and saying something you do not believe in for fear of repercussions. Saying, oh, you look exactly like you did 30 years ago to your high school sweetheart is not compelled speech. Compelled speech is when your institution issues a pledge to fight systemic racism and you are afraid to ask, is there any evidence of systemic racism in our university? <laughs> Instead, you stand up at the faculty meeting and pledge to apply yourself fully to dismantling systemic racism. We've met some of those people. Self-censorship is a reaction to oppressive environments. It is a symptom of fear. It is an indicator of cancel culture. Uh, and just uh, one more, couple more things here. Newspeak is invading, this again from Orwell's 1984, Newspeak is invading the English language in a truly Orwellian fashion. A few examples illustrate this. The journal Nature published a letter calling for the replacement of the accepted technical term quantum supremacy by quantum advantage. 
<laughs> the authors regard the English word supremacy as violent and equate its usage with promoting racism and colonialism. They also warn us about the damage inflicted by using such terms as conquest. Professional societies, including the Association for Computing Machinery and tech companies, including Google and IBM, joined the suit. Last spring, I attended a meeting on quantum information science. It was a sad spectacle to watch grown-up scientists stumbling, trying to avoid the offensive word. About 90% conformed to this idiocy. So this is important because science has been trotted out so much in the last almost three years, right? As, well, we know you, you know you can't trust yourself, and you know you don't know enough to really understand what's going on, but we're going to bring out some lab coat-wearing uh, scientists. Um, it's really hard to stay serious <laughs> with a really completely charming epic tabby on your chest like that. Um, uh, apologies to those. Sorry about that. Uh, just, uh, just, <laughs> back back just to listening. the horror. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, it, it makes things okay. That and the fact of excellent peaches in August helps make things okay. Um, we have m most of the the public who are not scientists have been sold a bill of goods, have been assured, and have believed that the scientists, when they speak, are correct. They know what they're doing because science, because you've all heard something about self-correcting, yada yada yada, and hypothesis maybe, and lots of math, and therefore it must be true. And what we see here in an anecdote, in an, in an article filled with stories that are mostly not anecdotes, but this happens to be an anecdote, is about 90% of the scientists at a professional society, the Association for Computing Machinery, um, oh no, no, the, the, uh, just she's, she doesn't specify, it's a meeting on quantum information science, about 90% of the attendees, all of whom are identified as scientists, tied themselves in knots trying to conform to the journal Nature's insane conclusion that the term quantum supremacy is violent and colonial. Okay, So if 90% of scientists will do that for a non-issue, mm. how can we assume that any scientist standing up and saying, follow the science, isn't long since gone, if they ever had any, any, any ability to think scientifically at all. You had... Well, there's a whole bunch yeah. uh, on that thread that I want to follow. Go for it. Um, the key thing, I think you make an excellent point. You're watching scientists bend over backwards over a trivial thing. Uh, and we actually pointed to the speech in um, Catch-22. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how long ago, but we pointed, there's a point at which the um, the Great Loyalty Oath campaign has gotten to a point of absurdity, and I think it's Colonel Cathcart comes into the um, mess hall and kills it off uh, by demanding that he give me eats uh, yeah. without signing a loyalty oath, and then as he walks away with his food, having intimidated them into serving him, everybody's hoping that he'll break the campaign, and he says, give everybody eats, and the Great Loyalty Oath campaign comes to a crashing uh, end. But it requires a benevolent dictator in the moment, doesn't it? It requires power, and the point is, absent that, the willingness of scientists to bend over backwards over a total non-issue when the real answer is, yeah, I'm not going to do that because it's stupid, <laughs> right? Yeah. The fact that nobody says that tells you how powerful this is and how unlikely it is that scientists will stand up over something difficult, right? Now, it just so happens that this links back to what we were talking about that led you here, and I don't know whether we should pursue that thread or you finish out your... Uh, I'm going to a couple piece. more things from, okay. from Krylov We'll come first. back to it, though. Brandeis University has a website dedicated to Newspeak. They recommend replacing trigger warning by content notice <laughs> and offer DEI-approved suggestions for replacements for... She doesn't provide Brandeis's recommended replacements, but they offer DEI-approved suggestions for replacements for take a stab at it, you are killing it, walk-in appointment, and abusive relationship. Now, I don't know what their problem with abusive relationship is, 
I can understand what their problem with abusive relationships might be, but right. the idea that the term abusive relationship needs to be replaced by a DEI sanctioned term such that you can guarantee that no one will know what you're talking about. But I'm betting that walk-in appointment is, is offensive because some people can't walk. That's my guess. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh -oh. all, that's all I got. Uh, so... <laughs> I mean, it's, and this is what we have to do. We have to laugh at these people. Right. We have to laugh at these people. We have to not comply and not affirm and not say, yes, sir, and say, you're insane and you're laughable and come on along with me. See how foolish you were being. And, you know, let's talk, okay? So um, a slightly longer section, one more uh, excerpt here. Um, her fourth theme in the piece is social engineering to solve real and imagined problems, writes Kryloff. In the USSR, everything was managed top down. So again, this is where she grew up. Social engineering was the main tool for building a supposedly better world. Let me share just one example. Our institutions were obsessed with demographics, which were controlled by quotas. For example, for Jewish kids, it was nearly impossible to get into top physics or mathematics programs. Why? Because Jews were overrepresented and having too many Jewish faces among mathematicians did not represent the demographic makeup of our great nation. That doesn't add up. I learned about the existence of Jewish quotas on my first day at university. Before that, I believed the official narrative, that everyone has fair access to education and everyone can pursue their dreams. My dream was to study chemistry, so I applied to the chemistry department at Moscow State University. I passed the entrance exams and was duly admitted. But then it happened that I learned from a high school friend that the chemistry department had a special track for theoret theoretically oriented students, and that it is very hard and very advanced. I had no idea what a theoretically oriented curriculum was about, but I signed up for it more or less than I dare because my friend told me that it is not suitable for girls. <laughs> so, Anna, being a girl at the time, now a woman, so I am there on the first day of classes, meeting my classmates for the first time. There are about 30 kids enrolled. The first surprise, there are only six girls. The second surprise, most of the kids were Jewish. And they were in the program because it was as close as they could get to what they really wanted to study, math and physics. It was a back door via the less visible chemistry program. I remember telling my classmates how excited I was about chemistry and how I could not wait to get into a chemistry lab. In response, another girl, who later became my best friend, told her story. I hate chemistry. I want to study mathematics, but look at me, she said. I am obviously Jewish, and my family name is Jewish, so I have zero chance of getting into a physics or math department. That was the USSR. Yeah. In uh, I think the eighties, um, near the near the end of its reign. Gosh, the eighties. Wow. Yeah. Um, the last words in her piece, which again was a, from a speech delivered at Duke about a year ago. What can be done? Here are some ideas. First, speak up. Do not submit to bullies. Refuse to speak news speak. If you see that the king is naked, say the king is naked. Second, organize. There is safety in numbers. Organizations such as the Academic Freedom Alliance, Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, and the Heterodox Academy can provide a platform for action and protection against repercussions. Do your share in defending humanism, democracy, and the liberal enlightenment. Here, here. Yeah. All right. So let me return back to a test case here. Go for it. Um, I think it is on the screenshot of the New York Times that I sent you that you uh, showed there, um, the Twitter search. The New York Times and others are promoting a story in the aftermath of Musk's takeover and uh, altering of the environment in which hate speech has uh, skyrocketed on Twitter in the aftermath. Is that there on that screenshot? Uh, I don't see it. Should have sent a different one that showed that better. Okay. Um, so, anyway, here's my point. A, this is a nonsense story as far as anybody can tell, right? I have been on Twitter plenty in recent days. I have not seen any hate speech. It's not showing up. And one obvious interpretation is that the, if, in fact, they are reporting anything real at all, that they are reporting something like the number of tweets, which would be an easily gamed metric, and they are not reporting what people are actually seeing, that is to say, impressions of these things. Mm. And those two things are liable to have diverged radically, given what Musk did with uh, certifications, where a huge number of people found themselves able to get certification quickly and now have access to filters 
groups that allow them to look at the content posted by other certified accounts. So were you to have an army of bots posting hate speech, either because they can or because the idea is to make Twitter look like a hellscape at the moment, then the New York Times and other such establishments could report that hate speech has taken off in the aftermath of this change, when in fact, from the point of view of actual users, the opposite has likely happened. Well, I mean, there are certainly a number of people who have those, those blue checks now and they can filter, but the vast majority of people still don't. Um, but I would say that the, that the bodies are likely to be buried with regard to this New York Times article that you're talking about that I have not seen in the definition of hate speech. <clears throat> you know, what it is that they are classifying as, as hate speech is uh, likely to be something about which reasonable people could disagree. Well, that is certainly true. It is also true that all eyes are on Twitter because zero is a special number, and therefore the amount that is resting on them being able to kill off Musk's experiment is much greater than we would think from a business perspective or size of Twitter perspective. Yeah. But the, the real point I want to make is this. One of the things that will emerge if we are able to have a free and open conversation about all topics, including difficult ones, is that this whole idea, the whole Woke revolution is founded on the idea that if we can police what you can say, that that will make people better, right? Yep. No way. Now, I have advanced a very difficult idea, one that people do not like, which is that there is a predictable reason that anti-Semitism in particular rises at certain moments in history, and it has to do with transfer frontiers, which you and I describe in our book. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, look, this is a matter of economic contraction causing two things. One, people's natural tendency to break into lineages and fight each other, and the cynical use of that instinct on people's part uh, by elites who do not want to be targeted, elites who may have concentrated wealth mm -hmm. and power in their own pockets and hands, and who are redirecting that anger at other people to whom we are evolutionarily biased to be suspicious. Yeah. That's a challenging argument. Now, that argument needs to be on the table, right? Of course, lots of people will tell you that that argument is somehow uh, justifying racism or something like this. They make the naturalistic fallacy. So in a world where petty people who know very little are empowered to police what is allowed to be discussed, an idea like that likely will not be discussed. Now, if you look at what's taking place, we are watching, any Jew knows that we are watching an immense rise in anti-Semitism in the last several years, but in particular in the last few months. My claim is that is a natural consequence of something which is being amplified by something else, and we better pay attention to what's causing that. It's not the freedom to talk this way that is causing people to do that. The freedom to talk that way is allowing us to see that they are doing that, mm -hmm. which is vitally important that we know. Mm -hmm. If we shield ourselves from what people are actually saying and thinking, then we are liable to be caught off guard, which is the worst possible thing that can happen in these cases. The key to understanding what to do and preparing properly for it is knowing that it's occurring. And so, again, the argument here couldn't be stronger. If you understand it at a deep level, this, the fact that you are seeing anti-Semitism means that we have to be alert to it and we have to be able to detect it rather than having some nanny decide that mm -hmm. you're going to you know, be emotionally harmed by hearing this and therefore you won't be allowed to even if you want to tune in, right? So, and, and the things that are being disappeared run the gamut from... Uh, truly horrible things that people believed at some points to uh, things within the range of normal for a time that is now past to made up things like getting rid of the word supremacy and quantum supremacy because apparently that's violent and yep. colonial. And so it's not even, like I, I, could, I could try to steel man the idea of, um, of censoring the past by saying if you if you see that something has been censored you know that that will have been a very bad thing i think it's a stupid argument but um it's it doesn't hold up because the variety of things that they're censoring is so remarkable you know they're they're trying to take out everyone you know everyone who isn't living in a bubble right now and most of language 
And, you know, I, it's part of why I find, um, you know, Krylov standing up as a scientist, as an academic scientist, and saying no, and no one else should be agreeing with this, particularly strong because, because she saw it. And we talked a lot in the first year or so of, of Dark Horse, a lot more than we have of late, about um, having noticed that many people who grew up behind the Iron Curtain or in Soviet, um, you know, in Soviet Russia, um, who have been in the U.S. or have been in the West for most of their adult lives or all of their adult lives, seem particularly likely to be able to see the stirrings and the intimations and sometimes the very obvious stuff that is happening with regard to the censorship and uh, and and worse. And you know, why should that be? Well, why should it be? Because these are people who can do pattern recognition and they saw this once before and they're seeing it now and if you think it can't happen here, you got another thing coming. I would also point out one other thing. On the list of tools that we need in order to navigate dangerous shit like this, mm -hmm. top of the list is humor. Yeah. Right? And the problem is, if you think you are going to police bad thought out of existence by detecting it when it is uttered and getting rid of it, well, what the hell do you do with the comedy that is necessary to ridicule bad ideas out of existence right right Th that is an essential tool and you know this goes back actually to the hot water that dave Chappelle got into uh, a few weeks back um, for pointing out the special power of the phrase the jews mm. now it was actually i mean I think he was wrong. I thought I, it was funny, but I, I don't know anything about this. He did, he did this on uh, on Saturday Night Live, and he was basically saying that you you that there is a rule, an unwritten rule, that in fact these, these are two words you can't put together: the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. And the point was that there's something to discuss about the Jews. And anyway, I did think it was funny. I did think it was wrong, but I also thought that wait, it, you did or you did not? I thought it was both funny and wrong. Mm -hmm. I know he has a point, mm -hmm. right? I don't think the point is the one that he made. But I also thought, I mean, A, as you know, I love Dave Chappelle, right? And I love Dave Chappelle, especially on issues of race, right? He's quite excellent. He has a way, it's not like he doesn't have a perspective, he does. Mm -hmm. But um, he also has a way of understanding what's on the other side of that, which makes his humor just devastating. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it was the invitation to a conversation that needs to be had, not a very comfortable one. Mm -hmm. But uh, one that I wish we would have, rather than right. try to, you know, bar such things at the door, um, which is only going to result in them, you know, festering and yep. then erupting in some much more troubling way. Yep. I mean, you know, in fact, I will point out that the Jews who got caught off guard in in Europe were Jews who were telling themselves, you know what, it sucks, it's terrible, but it will blow over, right? They underestimated the danger. Now, how much greater is the chance of underestimating a danger if somebody has protected you from hearing it being discussed, right? That's, right. That's a very bad idea. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yes, and in fact, um, I, remember, I remember exactly this sentiment uh, at... The FIRE conference, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, mm -hmm. I think is what FIRE stands for. We went, you were invited to speak at, and we went to the FIRE conference in 2017 uh, in, in Dallas. And one of the higher ups at FIRE, I don't remember exactly who, I'm, I'm afraid, said precisely this. And I don't remember who the sort of Yahoo white nationalist du jour was then. Um, so I'm not going to come up with the name. Um, but there was someone making the news, and there was all sorts of brouhaha about, like, you cannot let this man speak. And uh, this this guy associated with fire says, please let him speak. Like, <laughs> the best thing in the world for all of us who abhor the, the ideas and tenets of white nationalism is to let them talk and let them, you know, dig their own graves. Well... Let's do this right. I agree with this sentiment. Mm -hmm. I've said a similar thing, that I, I want to hear these people. I want, I want it known what they are saying. It does not mean that what they are saying does not catch on because people hear it. Mm -hmm. The problem is there's this deeper layer. Why does it catch on? If you're not dealing with the thing that supports racism 
anti-Semitism in particular, and I say in particular because the diaspora of Jews lends itself to being attacked when you have an economic contraction. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, there is a downside. It's not that no anti-Semite or other racist is going to persuade anybody by speaking. They will. But the point is, why are they vulnerable to being persuaded? That has to do with the stuff we really should be addressing, right? These things go away. They go away when times look a certain way, and then they come back when those conditions reverse. Mm -hmm. And understanding that pattern is the key to addressing this. You cannot, you cannot address it by policing speech. Right. And so even trying is absurd. And one other thing I wanted to add, the list of terms that we are supposed to swap out for other terms, <laughs> The tell in that one is trigger warning. Mm -hmm. Because trigger warning isn't actually a bad. It's one of the things that you could borrow from the woke revolution and say, actually, you know what, that has a place, right? Because what it does is it reduces the downside of speech, mm -hmm. right? If I say, look, I mean, in, in fact, I was in this situation. I gave trigger warnings. Not very regularly. I didn't feel required to give them. Mm -hmm. But I, I felt morally required sometimes. For example, evolutionary biology, there are cases in the animal kingdom. There are cases in human populations. There are cases in discussing human history where we have to talk about rape, mm -hmm. where it is an important force, right? doesn't mean justifying it, but we've got to talk about it. If you're going to talk about it, and you're going to talk about it to a room of women, some of whom will have had this experience, giving them a trigger warning is a compassionate thing to do, right? And so the point is, trigger warning, of all of the things that the woke revolution has asserted and promoted, right, that's one of the ones I would say, actually, you know what, I don't like what you've done with it. I don't like your absurd assertion about you know, the fact that somebody's guilty of something because they didn't utter one. But I do believe that it has a place, and that place is part of protecting speech rights, right? And yeah. so the whole idea, well, maybe that's the problem with trigger warning, is that too many people thought, actually, yeah, okay. Too many people who would be on the other side of that have actually said, yeah, actually, I'm going to give you a trigger warning because it's a reasonable thing to do. That's interesting, yeah. I, I never did, um, but... Uh... But in a you know in a day that was going to include three hours of sort of interactive lecture, um, the the kinds of topics that we would be talking about would be known in advance. So uh, I I so it was am, kind of already I am built positive in. that I never uttered the words trigger warning. Um, here's a trigger warning. Our epic tabby has just broken into the liquor cabinet. Oh my goodness! Off screen. All right. So <laughs> our producer is going to go. <laughs> rescue <laughs> the cat and close that up. Um, so uh, I do, I, I hadn't heard that explanation from you for why a trigger warning might be, right, might be valuable. And I think maybe, maybe what it amounts to is um, because, because you didn't leave a, a written trace you, know, you, you didn't have a syllabus wherein they could say, oh, this is the thing, this, these are the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, you had to do that in order to give them some, some indication. Uh, and I effectively... Uh, Built yeah. it in. And I, I, think, I think until you said it that way, I felt, like I think many people who object to the, the overreach and inconstant inconsistencies and diabolical nature of most of the diversity, equity, equity and inclusion um, movement thought that it was babying people, right? Like, you know, no, grow up. This is like, you're not going to get trigger warnings in life, so I'm not going to give you a trigger warning either. Uh, that said, okay, yes, we're talking about um, we're talking about sexual selection, evolution of sex, evolution of sex roles. We're talking about all of these things, and so you know you can and should expect uh, that difficult topics will come up around that. And if and if you don't, given what you know, all of the things that we're talking about are well, then that is on you. Actually. Yeah, although I would say, I mean, and I don't think a trigger warning necessarily has to be called a trigger warning. And right. it sounds like there was one, and it was sort of global. Right. Mm -hmm. There are difficult topics in here. They will come up. Right. So, you know, in any case, it's clearly a valid form. Right. It's mm -hmm. clearly 
as long as it is treated properly, it is clearly a valid form and um, it is being abused, as so many things are. I mean, the term woke itself uh, being an example of yep. uh, a valid concept that has been abused to the point of foolishness. Yep. Um, so we have, you can see the time. Yep. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left. And okay. I know there's uh, at least one more big thing that you want to talk about, and I have some things to add to it. So. Okay. Great. Um, unless you had more on that topic. No, I, th I think, I think we've, we've covered it. The next topic is related, as people yeah. will see. Um, so something came across my radar a couple days ago. And the funny thing is, I don't even, the source was odd, but I chased it down and it's for real. Um, the source was a publication that I don't think I've run across called the National Desk. Do you want to uh, put that screenshot up, Zach? There are two screenshots. Now let's try one. Uh, no, this is the, well, th this'll do, this'll do. We, you know what, take that off. Let me show first, because I've got an October article okay. um, that introduces this. Oh, great. That, that will be better, I think. Um, so, actually, Zach, you can show my screen. So this is on a site that I'd never heard of, hackshackers.com. Uh, which is one of the organizations that has just won. This is them announcing that they've, along with two other organizations, won a $5 million grant from NSF, from the National Science Foundation. And what they claim to be doing, I'm going to start lower and then read, um, well, actually, no. Yeah, I'm going to start lower. It says, Hacks Hacker, Hacks Slash Hackers, which is the name of the organization on whose website this is written, with this strange blinking cursor. I've never seen that in a headline before, but there you go. Uh, Hacks Hackers, the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, and partner organizations, maybe it's more than three, um, have received a new $5 million award from the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator. The award will support phase two development of the Analysis and Response Toolkit for Trust, ART, a suite of expert-informed resources that are intended to provide guidance and encouragement to individuals and communities as they address contentious or difficult topics online. So before you leave this, this screen, I have one more thing to read from this. Uh, okay, um, you, you, can, you can go off it for the moment. Um, actually, let me just read it because I've now lost where, what I was going to say. Um, the Art Guide, Zach, will you put it back up, please? The Art Guide software tool presents for the first time a unique framework of possible responses for everyday conversations around tricky topics, all informed by online information analysis to help motivated citizens answer the question, what do I say and how do I say it? That's it. NSF, the National Science Foundation, the biggest source of science funding that isn't explicitly medical or otherwise applied, and a lot of the research that NSF funds is applied, um, that American scientists have access to, has given $5 million to help motivated citizens answer the question, what do I say and how do I say it? When confronted That's with controversial talk. That's extraordinary. Well, it's extraordinary at a couple different levels. One, it's NSF, right? This is the federal government, okay? So A, free speech is central here, not only in its general meaning, but in its First Amendment meaning. Yes. Second thing is, Five million dollars? This is very much like the uh, award given to the TOGETHER trial after they had found that uh, um, ivermectin didn't work according to them, which of course is nonsense because their method wouldn't allow, it wasn't the proper test. Well, this is a, this is a grant to do research, supposedly, as opposed no, to no. an award It's the, the magnitude fact. I'm talking about. Five million dollars for what sounds like a group of, you know, bright-eyed young people to sit around a conference table and spitball about what might be said in the contentious conversation. So, five million bucks? How would you even spend five million bucks on this project? Well, now I think the screenshot that Zach showed earlier, let's see what they right. found so, so far. So this is a progress report. They're showing us so that they've already made some progress, and here's so the this, progress. So this was in October of 24th. Like they, they have just gotten this money, like five, six weeks ago, and now... And now... They've, uh, the thing has gotten off the ground. It says, uh, in addition to the toolkit, Hacks and Hackers is also developing a rating scale for reliable Wikipedia sources according to a job posting online. 
That project has already gotten off the ground. Wow, that's good news. So that five million bucks is not being wasted. Citing left-leaning sources like Vox, The New Yorker, The Guardian, and The Boston Globe as reliable, while citing conservative sources like Ben Shapiro, The Daily Wire, and biologist Brett Weinstein as unreliable. Now, A, this is sexist. How the hell have they attacked me and not you? <laughs> I, that is despicable. But let's just put, exude reliability. I guess that must be it. Mm. Um, but you and I agree on a lot of stuff, so I might just be like reflecting reliable stuff, but it's still reliable. In any case, I, A, this is insane. It's it's insane. So I, I guess I mean the, like everything is wrong with this, right? Uh, but just to take the last phrases on on the page here. Conservative sources like Ben Shapiro, The Daily Wire. Isn't aren't Ben Shapiro on The Daily Wire very like? Isn't Ben? Isn't The Daily Wire Ben Shapiro? Ben, Daily Wire is Ben Shapiro dressed for work. I see. Okay. And then in Ben Shapiro okay. is Ben Shapiro so, in casual clothes. Ben Shapiro is conservative for sure. Yes. And but that's kind of one thing. Right. And then um, let's see, biologist Brett Wein. Is it Stein or Stein? No, it's Stein. Oh, it's Stein. Okay. So biologist Brett Weinstein uh, is not a conservative source. And let me see, it's not unreliable. Not Actually, unreliable. Really like, well, and record is pretty good. I would, I would yeah. argue that if you would compare my record to any of the sources they cite as reliable, <laughs> Vox, I will beat the Vox, pants off all of Guardian. them. Guardian. Oh my of, god. Uh, worst of all, but yeah. But anyway, so okay, this is maddening. Yes. The federal government hmm. is paying these. Hackers, hacks, hackers, hacks, hackers, hacks, hackers, to generate guidance for what people should say in difficult conversations, and among the things that they've concluded early, because you know the more secure stuff at the foundation is that conservatives like me and Ben Shapiro and Ben Shapiro are in fact unreliable, right? <laughs> yeah. So, well, I'm apparently doubly so. <laughs> right, that's amazing. But mm -hmm. but the thing is, this is also tied into Wikipedia. Right. Mm -hmm. If you click through what you find, Zach, do you want to put up that? Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. So the point is, this list of reliable sources is actually a Wikimedia list, oh my God. which it declares people good and bad behind the scenes, so that this will cascade through the mm -hmm. building of the Wikipedia site on all of the topics that are relevant. So scroll down uh, or hit COVID-19 and you'll get <laughs> hit COVID-19. You scroll down here, you will find, uh, yeah, go, go to where you start seeing all of the warning there be dragon symbols. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's Ben Shapiro, there's Brett Weinstein, there's, yeah, yeah. Uh, Daily Mail. Right, so anyway, Daily look, Wire, look, Epic Times. I did an episode of Dark Horse um, in which we discussed uh, with Norman Fenton the appalling breakdown of Wikipedia into a partisan... Yeah. It's actually, it's worse than partisan. If it was simply partisan like the New York Times, you could roll your eyes at it. But the problem is, it's still the best encyclopedia going if you want to know the volume of your favorite lake or you want to know mm -hmm. what kind, you know, what sex determination in anglerfish looks like. I don't know at this point that I would trust them on sex determination in anything, honestly. I agree. Honestly. I take that one back. <laughs> um, like, uh, mm. The geographic distribution of <laughs> anglerfish, probably sure. they're still reliable on. Yes. But the point is, Okay, the greatest encyclopedia, encyclopedia of all time moonlights as a mechanism for slandering sources who say things inconvenient to the elite cabal uh, mm -hmm. dressed in blue, and that is extremely dangerous, mm -hmm. right? But so, okay, the federal government is influencing this organization. It is drowning them in money so that they can have, I'm sure, a really nice conference Jeez, table I to speak. they can breathe. Whatever they're doing, these people are now influencing Wikipedia, which we know to be extremely partisan and involved in slander. And the point is, how many unwitting people are going to be influenced by the NSF, which has laundered its plan mm -hmm. through this organization and through Wikipedia? Okay, but here's, here's the bright side. Yep. Okay. Oh, good. Um, so we got hacks hackers, whoever they are, uh, joining with a, a school. It was a school of like computer something something at some university, presumably. Um, so there's got to be some 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 people who really know what science is doing the science. We we presume because they're making all the decisions about uh, reliability of sources, talking about vaccines. Well, they're right? sciencing. Right. They're they're sciencing. They're sciencing it up. 
Um, and Zach, if you would show my screen, Pfizer at least has our backs. Okay. Oh, so good. Pfizer has tweeted uh, recently, wouldn't it be great if a few internet searches could land you a PhD? Thank goodness for real scientists. So they, in like a nod to the onion or Babylon Bee, incredible. Area man, now full-fledged scientist, thanks to one internet search, which I don't know, kind of sounds like the hack hackers people to me, I'm guessing. So hold on, come back to my screen here for a second, Zach, um, because the very next screenshot I want to show you, which just is a tiny bit back in Pfizer's feed, um, now actually it's the top of their feed as of this morning, is we are proud, this is Pfizer, is proud to announce Pfizer's manufacturing division has won the most valuable collaboration award at the 2022 USA Reuters Pharma Awards. The Reuters Pharma Awards, of course. This is a testament to all our hardworking colleagues who continue to innovate and grow. The USA Reuters Pharma Awards. Yeah. Well, gee, I didn't know. Is that a fact? That a news agency, <laughs> one of the largest, at least in the US, if not the world, was in the business of giving out awards to pharma companies. <laughs> but I guess you live, you learn. And um, I did look a little bit at uh, at their site here. Let's uh, let's show the site here, Zach. This is the Reuters events. Apparently, does a, a number of things. This isn't the only one, but um, here they're announcing the Pharma Awards for 2023, uh, where pharma's true value gets true recognition, and they're going to uh, show us the 2020 uh, categories for their awards. Are going to include the Driving Health Equity Award. Okay. Driving health equity. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And the Delivering Inclusive Trials Award. Whoa. So there's nothing in any of these about the actual veracity of what the claims that the pharmaceutical companies are making. There's, there, I see well, nothing in any of these lists. Nothing. And just one more thing. Don't leave my screen yet here. Um, if you go to the facts, the frequently asked questions, it's not that interesting. The entry process, the judges, it's all garbage. Um, but at the very bottom of every single page, can't wait to experience this together. Mm. No question mark. Can't wait to experience this together. I can. Says Reuters Pharma Awards. <laughs> can't wait to experience this together. I can too. All right. I can too. So I think there are two things that uh, you have um, elided here that belong in the discussion. Excellent. I looked at that tweet about uh, <laughs> Area Man on the basis of a single search. This one. Uh, Hold on. This one. Can you put it up, Zach? Yes. Maybe. Um, yes, this one. I looked at this one, and of course, uh, I felt my eyes bulging and my temperature and blood pressure both going up simultaneously. Um, but why? You've got a PhD. <laughs> well, that's just the thing. Is mm -hmm. You and I have two PhDs together, uh, and we have been uh, slandered and libeled um, clearly by things that are uh, closely affiliated with this particular entity. And so the point is, it dismissing people who have done searches that result in them finding information that matches, but you and I have spent hundreds of hours discussing and explaining why we reached the conclusions we did and altering them when some new piece of information came up or when we learned that we had been wrong, right? All of that counts for nothing. They're gonna mock the guy who comes to a conclusion that makes sense because, of course, he doesn't have a PhD, which is credentialism in the stupidest sense. But, yes. two things. Yes. One, I recalled, and in fact, you can find it on Unheard site. They discussed the research that showed that the acceptance of the vaccines had a U-shaped distribution, that there were two groups of people who were particularly hesitant about the vaccines. The rejection has a U-shaped. The acceptance has an inverse U-shaped. Okay. Yeah. Depends whether the horseshoe is emptying luck over your door or... If you say U-shaped, you just gotta... All right. Yeah. The rejection <laughs> has a U-shaped distribution where people who have very little education have rejected uh, the COVID vaccines and people who have PhDs also have uh, rejected them in disproportionate numbers. Those are the two educational demographics um, in which people have rejected them at higher levels uh, than among the high school and college educated. Correct. And so the idea that they are going to use the fact that Area Man does not have a PhD and has searched the internet and found something uh, as an indication, but of course, 
They did not get a thousand responses that said that to their goddamn tweet. You well, know. they did. They did get a lot of quote tweets. I didn't, I didn't go oh, through them. But quote they got, tweets, but they turned off replies. Right. They, they, they exactly. They, they prevented people from actually replying directly. But they got. I'm sure they got a lot of mockery. And I, I mean, this is part of. Right. But we're not going to talk about this week. Why? You know, the thing that I alluded to earlier about you know what what has sort of been throwing me. Um, but I am. I am probably the next time we come, we'll talk about it a little bit, which is going to be in two weeks. And. And I may post something about it in my in natural selections this week, but I, but I will say that one of the things that I've really been um, thinking about anew, having given this thought for decades, is how much everyone needs to be encouraged to do what most people do innately and have educated out of them, which is think scientifically, make observations, see patterns, Figure out what those patterns might mean. That's your hypothesis. Figure out if that hypothesis that you've made is true, what else would necessarily be true. That's your prediction. Figure out what would, what, how you could assess whether or not that prediction that you've made that follows necessarily from that hypothesis is or is not true. That would be your test. Now, people don't need to then you know, run the tests, right? But in their daily lives, Everyone inherently should be doing this, should be assessing the information that comes in, as opposed to having hacks hackers tell them what to, what to say. I mean, like, literally, they put that in their press release. What do I say and how do I say it? A motivated citizen needs to, needs hack, hack hackers, who are the biggest hack jobs I've seen this week, who put you as a conservative providing misinformation about vaccines on their list, they are the people who want to tell you and us what to say and how to say it. Well, no. We are all supposed to decide, all of us individually, what to say and how to say it. And we're supposed to figure out what to say and how to say it by figuring out what is true. And we figure out what is true by observation and by figuring out where people are making sense and listening to them and engaging with them and engaging with other people who seem to be making sense and testing them and prodding them and saying, no, I don't agree with you. Why do you think that when you don't agree with someone and, and you want to, and you have access to them and you can say, why do you think that? And not acquiescing and being one of the 90% of scientists who said, yeah, 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 no quantum supremacy for me. No, we're all supposed to be doing this as individuals because we all have agency and autonomy and we're just losing it. We're just losing the plot collectively. Yep. And, you know, you can, just as it is true that uh, if, you okay, Dougie? Um, if ivermectin didn't work, the idea that you would need some giant fraud that was built to fail to prove it, of course you wouldn't. Right. If ivermectin didn't work, you could just run a large-scale randomized controlled trial. You could give it to people early. Mm -hmm. um, you could give it to them in sufficient doses. You could not hide the cap of the doses. It would just demonstrate itself not to be very useful, right? Yeah. The fact that you find fraud tells you something. And the fact that you and I are being, people are being told they should not pay attention to us. Who are they being told they should not pay attention to? Well, to biologists who say that predictive power is the way that you will know whether somebody knows what they're talking about. Right. Right? Like, how could we game our own system? Either we have predictive <laughs> power or we don't, right? And if we don't have predictive power, then people may listen to us, and then they will discover we don't know what we're talking about because we fail to predict stuff. Maybe, I mean, maybe to go full circle, it's, it's postmodernism again. It is. It's like, you know what? You people may have predictive power, but you must be manipulating reality. Like, you know, that, that's the only consistent thing that they could be believing, uh, wherein... Two people who, yes, have the credentials that uh, give us the respectability to be talking about the things that we do, because we both have PhDs in biology, but also are just employing the scientific method day in, day out, in front of you guys, not in front of you guys, all the time, to try to figure out what is true. And sometimes what is true is surprising, and sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's ugly, and sometimes it's beautiful, and none of your emotional reaction to it changes whether or not it's true or not. Well, you know it. I think what's actually happening is that the uh, elites who are exerting power to do this, the rent seekers, because of the time traveling money printer idea, have, they think wisely, decided to blind the rest of us. And it's like, yes, it's a dark age, but 
the point is, oh, we're going to put blindfolds on you all, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure you can't see things. And what they think they've done is they have privatized the information that allows them to live well and make money. But they don't realize that actually, no, the science, scientific system is not going to work privately, right? They are, in mm -hmm. fact, blinding themselves, too, and they just don't realize it. And they are putting themselves in grave danger. And, uh, yeah, there's that happening over there. But... Yeah. Um, <laughs> But in any case, I do feel like they have cultivated a dark age thinking that they were clever for doing it, and uh, they have no idea, you know, it's, it's Sorcerer's Apprentice, and it is, yeah. uh, you know, they, it's Sorcerer's Apprentice, and it is... Uh, we got all the broom drones coming now. They do. Yeah. They do, and they just, they don't even know how to turn it off. They don't even know that they need to turn it off, because they feel, yeah. you know, short term, it's giving them a positive signal. Um, all right, well, maybe he's telling us something. Maybe he is. I don't yet know what language he's speaking. Nope. But um, but no, this is actually working pretty great. Okay, that's perfect. That's pretty true. Yeah, that's a new actually. method. So apologies for those just listening. You should definitely come and just take a view of the last bit of our show today, wherein the cat gets blanket in his mouth. And okay, um, are we there? We are there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, the animals do make life tolerable in moments when it seems like the conversation, the official conversation that has the imprimatur of all of the things, the science, the media, the everything, is getting stupider and stupider and stupider. But here we go. These guys aren't. They're not getting stupider. They're getting covered in blanket fur, but that's different. All right. Uh, so we will be back in two weeks. Not next week. Uh, but we will also be back in 15 minutes, so that's sooner. Yes, <laughs> quite a bit, actually. Quite a bit sooner. Uh, yeah, I did the math on that. Mm. Yeah, uh, and um, we're going to come back with a kid. You did the math. Because you're not Jewish, that's not a problem. Even though 15 is bigger than 2. Whoa. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I was allowed to do really bad math because uh, I'm not a, a, a Jew in, in Soviet era Russia. Okay, um, ask questions at darkhorsesubmissions.com for the Q&A that's coming up shortly. Uh, you can always email logistical questions that you may have that don't have to do with questions that you want on air to darkhorsemoderator at gmail.com. Consider joining our Patreons. Uh, <laughs> read on to gather his guide to the 21st century, where uh, we did keep in a small section on pets, and uh, and and I believe I think it's still in there. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it's still in there. There was so much we had to cut, but uh, where you might learn something about what the heck is going on on camera. I guarantee right now. you, whatever remained in our book, there is nothing about pets appreciating art, which I think I am now observing for the first time. <laughs> Maybe he thinks the armadillo looks delicious. <laughs> okay, until we see you next, be good to the ones you love, eat good food and get outside. Be well, everyone. <laughs>